here. And uh, we were talking about last time equilibrium. And equilibrium really does sort of involve a specific type of reaction as we talked about. And these are reversible reactions. And it's these reversible reactions, which basically have, as we talked about, basically two directions. There's the uh, forward direction, uh, which is basically reactants heading to products. And at some point, there will be enough uh, products that have been made that they will actually recombine and sort of head back in the other direction, products back to reactants. And again, that is what is sometimes referred to as the reverse direction. And eventually what will happen is uh, this system will reach what is referred to as chemical equilibrium. And again, as we talked about, chemical equilibrium doesn't necessarily mean that you have the exact same amount of everybody on both sides of the arrow. It's actually referring to the rate of these reactions or the forward reaction, the reverse reaction. And when it reaches equilibrium, the rate of the forward direction will equal the rate of the reverse direction when it actually does reach chemical equilibrium. So ultimately what that means is just as fast as it kind of goes in that forward direction, it will turn around and come back the other way. And the result of that is uh, pretty much wherever anybody is at in that situation in terms of their concentrations, in terms of their pressures, uh, they basically will maintain those pressures and concentrations. As long as you don't do anything to screw up the equilibrium, they basically go back and forth. So they sort of lock themselves into place when they reach chemical equilibrium. I think we saw sort of a graph, if you will, and we start here with our products and here, say, with our reactants, for example. At the beginning, it's all the forward direction sort of happening to make some of the products. At that point, we'll start making some of our products. And eventually what happens is they sort of will level out and maintain their concentrations. And that's basically where chemical equilibrium has been reached uh, when there's really no change in it. In terms of chemical equilibrium, uh, sort of on the large scale there, it may appear that nothing much is happening. Maybe the reaction's over. Uh, but in order to maintain that, there's a lot of activity that's happening sort of underneath the surface, if you will. On the molecular level, there's reactants going to products, there's products going to reactants. There's a lot of activity happening when you do have a reaction that has reached equilibrium, even though sort of appearance-wise, if you're looking at the test tube, the flask, whatever it may be, uh, it may appear like there's not much going on, but there is a lot of activity basically going on. There is a relationship that we use here with these type of reactions, uh, which is known as the equilibrium constant. And that is abbreviated with a capital K. And to calculate the equilibrium constant, the K is equal to the concentration of our products. And we do take the coefficient from the balance equation as like the exponents when we do that. And again, a reminder that when you see the little brackets, that is basically molarity or concentration is what we're talking about there, divided by the concentration of our reactants. And since these are all concentrations, this is sometimes more specifically referred to as Kc because it is the equilibrium constant for concentration. There are a couple of things that we do not include in these sort of expressions. We do not put in anything that is a solid or a pure liquid. So those two things pretty much are left out of the equilibrium constant expression. Uh, they really won't participate in the equilibrium, so we do not put them in. That pretty much leaves only two things that go in. We do put in anything that has an aqueous symbol next to it or anything that is a gas. So those two things are really the ones that go into that expression. In certain situations, you may have an equilibrium here that's basically all gases. And in that case, you could also write an equilibrium constant expression that uses pressures rather than uh, concentration, as obviously we deal with pressures a lot when we're dealing with gases. 
And that is basically the same thing. It's still your products over your reactants, but use the partial pressures of your products. You still take it to the coefficient divided by the partial pressures of your reactants. Once again, you're still taking it to your coefficient there. And this is what is sometimes referred to as the Kp value, P being pressure in that situation. Typically speaking, that's like atmospheres is typically the value, the con units that you should use when you go into that expression um, is usually what you want to use and usually molarity up there on top. Now, in most cases, the Kc value and the Kp value won't numerically be the same value, uh, but they do tell you the same thing. So the other thing that we talked about was that the K values are really just numbers. There's no units associated with it, but it is a number. And typically, if you have a K value that is large, that means when you reach equilibrium, you should mainly have products. And that's because we do products divided by reactants. So in order to get a large number, you have to have more products than reactants. And if you have a K value that is really small, uh, that means when you do reach equilibrium, you're going to mainly have reactants present. And again, just mathematically speaking, you have to have more product, uh, less products than reactants in that case to get a smaller number. What is large? What is small? It is that value of one, basically. Uh, so really anything kind of considered above one is considered large. Anything less than one is considered small. And as I think we talked about last time, there is various degrees of large and small. Uh, as I mentioned, you know, there are some that are really, really small, like to the minus 42. Um, and there are some that are really, really large, like times 10 to the 50. So, you know, there's anywhere in between really, really small, really, really large to degrees of K values. K values are constant values for a particular reaction, the way they're written at a specific temperature. So temperature is really the only thing that will affect the actual value of K. And what that means is, as we talked about last time, if you did the same reaction at two different temperatures, uh, you would have two different K values. But if you did one reaction or multiple reactions at 25 degrees, four or five experiments, and it's the same reaction, you should end up with the same K value every time for 25 degrees-ish, you know, experimental obviously, but pretty close to each other. And same thing, if you rose it up to 40 degrees Celsius, uh, you should also, if you did, say, five times the same reaction, you should get the same K value for 40 degrees Celsius. But when you compare 40 degrees to 25 degrees Celsius, those values will also be different in terms of, of their values because of the temperature. The other thing that sometimes is hard for people to understand as well is the idea that it really doesn't matter how much of anybody you start with. You can start with all reactants. You can start with all products. You can do a little bit of everybody. And as long as you don't change the temperature, it will always come to rest at the same K value, basically same ratio of products to reactants. So I think I did last time, you know, if you wanted to get the number two, there's multiple ways you get number two, you know, four divided by two, two divided by one, you know, eight divided by four. So these are all different ratios, right? But they all end up in the same number at the end. And that's sort of the same idea here. Um, you'll end up with the same sort of ratio when it's all said and done. <clears throat> Clearly, if you are putting anything into the equilibrium, constant expression, it does need to be equilibrium concentrations or pressures to go into there. I think we did a couple last time. And also, if you had maybe the K value and some of the other values, you could solve for an equilibrium concentration. Any questions on any of that stuff there? <clears throat> okay. So I think where we're at officially now is to uh, Le Chatelier's principle. And basically Le Chatelier's principle, uh, as we talked about when we did that lab, um, we basically have a system that is at equilibrium. And basically what you're going to do is, and at this point, it's obviously the rate of the forward direction will equal the rate of the reverse direction in this case. And what you're gonna do is basically add some type of stress to the system. And the problem with when you add a stress to the system is you're gonna really mess up that nice rate of the forward reaction, the reverse reaction basically happening at the same time. So you're gonna kind of screw it up. 
but the reaction itself will try to self-correct, if you will, and it will try to self-correct and get itself back to that state of equilibrium where the rate of the forward reaction and the reverse reaction will equal each other. So you add the stress, the reaction will adjust. And really there's sort of three things that in Le Chatelier's principle that it can do. It can shift to the right, uh, which basically means it obviously needs to make more products. It can shift to the left, uh, which means it needs to make more reactants. And there are certain things that you could do to a system that really, even though you did something to it, uh, will cause no change to occur. So those are sort of your three options when you're dealing with Le Chatelier's principle. And basically you kind of screw up the equilibrium. But once again, what will happen is after it sort of adjusts, the reaction will once again come back to equilibrium. So there are major things that you could do to a reaction uh, that can cause effects. So let's talk a little bit about the stresses. Uh, you could do something with the concentration. You can do something with the pressure or the volume, especially if you're dealing with gases. Uh, you could do something with temperature. And you could also add a catalyst. So these are a few things that you can do to a system that's at equilibrium. And again, the system will basically adjust accordingly based on what you did. So we're going to take a look at each of these here and again, see how the system will sort of adjust to this. So we're going to start with concentration. And again, in terms of concentration, you basically could do two things. You could add more or you can remove. And basically when we add more, it will always shift away from the side we added it from the two. And when we remove, it will always kind of shift towards the side. We added it to, I guess removed, I guess would be a better word there, removed. So uh, in this case, we add away and we remove, it comes towards. Uh, once again, um, if you add reactants, you should go to products, you add products, you should go to reactants and vice versa. So again, if we just kind of look at the little seesaw stick figure type of situation here. And again, if this guy's our reactant, this guy's our products. And in this situation, we add another person to this side of it. What's going to happen is it is obviously going to mess up that equilibrium. So in this case, we obviously would need to add more people to the left-hand side, right? To kind of balance it back out. And that is away from the side we added people to. So it will shift away, put more people on the other side. And again, once again here, we will come to equilibrium. In this particular case. Now, again, same thing would happen if we started again with our guys here. Hopefully his head's okay. It looks a little disconnected there. All right. So in this particular case here, we're going to have this guy hop off. And when he does, this is pretty much going to be the result of it. So it's like we removed that guy. In this case, really, to balance it back out, we need to go towards the side that the guy jumped off of. So the equilibrium would shift towards the product side in this case. Put more people back on. And then again, once again, here, we will be back at equilibrium. Any questions on that there? <clears throat>
So really what is happening to sort of make that occur? Well, if you just think about it, if we added, for example, in this particular case here, more products, that's gonna mean that there's really more products available in that reaction and the availability of products, right? Affects, you know, the reaction happening. So the more products available, what that's gonna really do is kick off the reverse reaction to occur. And so there's gonna be a lot more product coming into each other, a lot more products when we head back the other way, basically to make more reactants. In the case over here, when we remove products, uh, we essentially kind of make a hole on the product side, which means in a sense, there are more reactants than products. And because there's more reactants than products, that's gonna actually kick off the forward direction to basically occur. And that's why we do see a shifting to that direction. So sometimes you can think of it as like when you remove something, you create a hole. So it's got to go towards the hole to kind of fill it back up is a good way to kind of think about it. And again, uh, when you add, it's got to go away to, you know, kind of level out what you added it to. Now, clearly we talked about, I think when we were doing the lab, uh, if you are adding something, it's pretty simple, much like you did, you could grab a bottle of whatever you want and you can basically just drop it in there. Now, obviously removing is a little bit different to remove something, typically make one of two things. You could add something that's not in the equilibrium, uh, but will react with somebody in the equilibrium to cause a solid to be formed. And the formation of a solid is basically one way that you could kind of reach in there and remove ions from the solution. The other way is if you have any type of equilibrium that has hydroxide, OH minus, or H plus, or H3O plus in it, uh, you could add an acid or base to it, and you can make water, which is something you might not be able to visually maybe see that you made water, uh, but that is a very common way, especially with the addition of an acid or base, to remove something like hydroxide or H plus from the solution. Um, so those are two common ways, obviously, you, in a solution type situation, you could kind of reach in there and pull something out. Any questions on that there? <clears throat> okay. Then let's talk a little bit about pressure and volume. And really, these two guys are pretty much kind of tied together in most cases. And it's a good way to kind of think about these guys as being together. And if we remember from our gas laws, there's our good friend Boyle, right? That had a nice relationship about pressure and volume. When my pressure goes up, what happens to my volume? Volume goes down, right? So the opposite relationship and vice versa. When my pressure goes down, volume goes up. So me personally, I, I like to think about it in terms of volume. So what happens in a situation like this is if our pressure goes up, our volume is going to go down. So sort of the change that's happening is we're going to see sort of a spike in the pressure. And really to fix it, we want to bring the pressure back down. And the only way to bring the pressure back down in a much smaller volume is, do I need more or less gas molecules? I would need less gas molecules, right? Because if I put more gas molecules in a small volume, pressure will continue to go up, right? More collisions. So we would need less gas molecules. And this would shift to the side with the least number of gas molecules. And obviously that is reaction dependent as to which way has more or less gas molecules. Uh, you'd have to look at the specific reaction you're looking at. Now, if the pressure goes down, that means the volume goes up. So once again, in this situation, the change is sort of occurring is the pressure is dropping. So when we have a much larger volume and we want to bring the pressure back up, uh, we would need more gas molecules in there. More gas molecules can cause more collision. It's going to bring the pressure back up. So it would shift to the side. With more gas molecules. And again, that obviously is specific for whatever reaction you may be looking at. So for me personally, I, I think about it in terms of volume. So smaller volume, less gas molecules, larger volume, more gas molecules. That's just a good way to remember it. Small, large, more gas molecules that you need to put in there. Any questions on that there? All right, so if we had something like this, uh, let's go with 2A. All 
All right, so decide what will happen here. Will we shift to the right? Will we shift to the left? Will there be no change if we did each of the following? We added more B, we removed A, added C, increased the pressure, increased the volume. All right, so take a moment there for each of those. Which way should it shift in this case for each of those? Okay, let's take a look. Uh, so here we're gonna add more B. So B is a reactant. And again, we always add, it goes away from the side we added it to. So we add it to a reactant, it should shift away from it to the product side. And again, the real reason here is we have more reactants. So more reactants, we're gonna start reacting together and cause the forward direction of this reaction basically to occur and we're gonna make more products. Now we're going to actually remove A, which is over here. So what that's going to essentially do is create a hole there on the reactant side, which means really we have more products than reactants. So that's gonna go in the opposite direction. It's actually, if you wanna think about going to try to fill that hole, and it will shift towards it, uh, which would mean obviously it would go to the left in this case. Any question on those two? Coming here to add C, adding more C is a product in this case. And adding more C means now we definitely have more products and reactants that again is going to allow the reverse direction to occur. And it's going to shift away from it as it should start heading towards our reactant side. We're going to increase the pressure. And when we increase the pressure, that means that the volume gets smaller. And again, in the smaller volume, as we talked about, we actually want less gas molecules to bring the pressure back down. So we look at this and don't overthink it. It's anybody with a G and the coefficient. So that's a two and a one. So there's three gas molecules on this side. And over here, there are two gas molecules which means in this case, it would shift to the right, which has less gas molecules. And lastly here, we're gonna increase the volume. The result of that is really the pressure is gonna to start to drop. So to bring the pressure back up, we need to actually fill that larger volume with more gas molecules. So as we just calculated there, it is the left-hand side there that has more gas molecules. Any questions on any of those there? <clears throat> Okay, so that is pressure and volume. Again, obviously related to gases and you wanna always look at gas molecules on each side to compare which side has more or less, nothing else, just the gas molecules. All right, then uh, the next thing that can affect uh, the equilibrium is temperature. And the nice thing about temperature is it works the same way as concentration. which means if you increase the temperature, it will shift away. And if you decrease the temperature, it will shift towards it. So what determines sort of which way it's going to shift is really the type of reaction that you're dealing with. And it depends on whether or not the reaction is endothermic or exothermic. So if we have a exothermic reaction, that means heat and energy is released. And what we consider a exothermic reaction is heat and energy is a product. So we consider it to be a product. Uh, so that means, obviously, if you increase an exothermic reaction's temperature, you're increasing products. And if you decrease the temperature of an exothermic reaction, you are removing products. Most commonly, if you remember, we probably have talked about it, the delta H of the reaction, which is the enthalpy, is oftentimes given to you. And remember, for it to be exothermic, it simply just needs to be a negative value. It doesn't really matter the actual number. But if you see a delta H value and it's negative, uh, you know it is a exothermic reaction. Endothermic is opposite. 
Uh, that means heat and energy is absorbed. And we consider heat or energy a reactant in that case. So in an endothermic one, if you increase the temperature, it will go to the right. And if you decrease it, it will come to the left there. And again, for the delta H here, it is usually a positive value. And again, that's a very common way that you're sort of given where in our reaction is exothermic or endothermic. The last thing that you could kind of do to it is you could add a catalyst and a catalyst will speed up the reaction. but uh, will cause no change to occur. So no change will occur. You'll just get there quicker. Other things that could possibly cause no changes, things like adding a noble gas uh, will also not do anything because it's chemically inert um, as well. <clears throat> Any questions on that there? All right, so let's take a look at one here. Give a few more. So let's do, will it shift to the right, uh, shift to the left, or no change? Let's do uh, N2 plus H2 and H3 to two, 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 six. Let's see, delta H is equal to positive 125. Not the right number. We'll just make up a number. Why not? All right, let's see here. Let's say we uh, decreased the pressure. We added NH3. We lowered the temperature. We removed... H2, we decreased the volume, we raised the temperature. And we added N2. All right, so for each of those, which way? Yeah, let's take a look. Uh, so first one, we're going to decrease the pressure, which means really the volume is going to increase. So again, in that larger volume and the pressure coming down, we kind of want to bring it back up. So we will need more gas molecules in this case. And the left-hand side here has four, it looks like, and right-hand side has two. Uh, so in this case, it should shift to the left in this case. Again, just counting the coefficients for anything that has a G next to it uh, will get you there. Adding NH3, again, an NH3 is a product, uh, which means we're really increasing our products. That's going to cause the reverse reaction to occur, and it will shift away from it, which means it should go to the left as well. Lowering our temperature, so looking here, that is a positive value for delta H, which means it's endothermic. Endothermic means you could think of heat and energy as a reactant. So if we lower the temperature, that's like removing some reactants, causing a hole on that side, and that should cause it to go towards the hole there to fix it and fill it, and it would shift to the left. Any questions on those so far? We're going to remove H2, which is also a reactant. So once again, this would cause another kind of hole on the reactant side, meaning we have more products. It's going to kind of go in that direction to kind of fill the hole. So it would shift here to the left as well. We're going to decrease the volume, uh, which means really here the pressure is going to go up. So as the pressure goes up, we kind of want to bring it back down. So in this case, the only way to do that in a smaller volume, small volume, less gas molecules. So we need to go to the side with the least number of gas molecules, which in this case is the right-hand side there. We're going to raise the temperature. So earlier we determined it is endothermic and raising the temperature would in this case be like adding more reactants. So more reactants are gonna have the forward reaction occur and it's going to shift away from it. 
which would go that way. Did I go all left and all rights? So let me see. Added more N2. I think I did. So adding more N2 here, uh, again, it's going to have more reactants than products. If you want to think about that way, it's really going to cause the forward reaction to occur, and it's going to shift away from it, which means it goes to the right in this case. Any questions on Le Chatelier's principle there? Once again, another common way or way that you could get a no change in addition to a catalyst or adding like a normal gas is you could have a potentially the same number of gas molecules on each side. And that would mean that there would be no change because there's really no side that's more or less gas molecules. So if you run into a situation where you got equal numbers of gas molecules on both sides of the arrow, uh, it really will cause a no change to occur because there's really no more or less. Any questions on Le Chatelier's principle there? All right. All right. So obviously this is what we've been talking about, effect of concentration, change in volume, pretty dear pictures, <laughs> change in volume. All right. Uh, as we also talked about, again, uh, remember that it is temperature. That is really the only thing that will affect the actual value of K when comparing between two different temperatures. All right, so let's take a look at this one. Consider the reaction here. How many of the following changes would lead to a shift in the equilibrium towards the reactant side? So we're looking for everybody to come this way, basically. If I removed CO, which is here, that actually should go to the right-hand side, which means that would not do it. If I add O2, which is a product, that would increase the reverse reaction. So that should do it. The removal of CO2, which is a reactant, again, that would cause a hole on the reactant side. So everybody would shift towards it to fill it. So that would also do it. And since the answer of three is box, I'm assuming the last one should do it. But let's take a look. Increasing the pressure uh, by decreasing the volume. So we decrease the volume. Uh, we see the pressure come up. We want to bring the pressure back down. So we need less gas molecules. And again, on this side, there are three gas molecules. On this side, there is only two. So obviously that would do it as well. Any questions on that one there? <clears throat> okay. All right, so looking at this one, one method of production of hydrogen gas uh, is described here in this endothermic reaction, how many of the following will decrease the amount of hydrogen gas produced? So if we're going to decrease the amount of hydrogen gas produced, this equilibrium would need to shift away from the hydrogen gas, obviously, right? So we would want to cause, again, this equilibrium to shift there to the left. If we added water, uh, it would actually be adding more reactants, and it would shift it to the right. So clearly that would not do it. By the way, we can add water here because it is in the gas phase. Yes, so it will actually have an effect. If you added liquid water, no effect. Yeah, so again, the state here is important. Um, sometimes people see water, they always think liquid, but a gas guy would be included in equilibrium constants and those type of things, situations as well. If we doubled the volume of the container, it got larger. That would cause our pressure to decrease which means we would want to bring it up by having more gas molecules. And on this side here, we got two. On this side here, we have four. That would cause the equilibrium to shift to the right, which should not do it. If we remove CH4, which is a reactant, that will cause the equilibrium to shift to the left to fill that hole. So that's going to do it for us. And lastly here, the temperatures increased. So this again is an endothermic reaction, which means heat would be considered a reactant. And if we increase it, it would shift away, which would not do it. Yeah. Yeah. No chance. Yeah. Yes. It, would, it wouldn't really cause any effect. Because again, if you think about it, if you had a solid, it would just kind of sink to the bottom. If you want to think about it like a rock. So it's just going to sit there. It's really not going to participate in anything that's going on. In order for it to participate, it would have to dissolve, which at that point is no longer a solid. It would be something like aqueous ions, which it then would be included. So adding solid or uh, liquid really won't have an effect on it. That's why it's really not included in the equilibrium constant. Yeah. Other questions? OK, 
Okay, so it looks like number three there was our one guy that did it. All right. All right, so we've talked about the extent of K. And again, um, the larger the value of K, mostly products, reaction will essentially go to completion, especially if you have a really, really large value of K. Uh, you could almost think of it as all going to the product side. Just like if you had a really, really small value of K, you could think of it as all really pretty much staying on the reactant side. Nothing much is being made. But even in those extremes, as I think we talked about last time, uh, there is still a reversible reaction, which means even though it may almost 100% of it go to the product side because it's a really large value of K, there's still a little bit of it will sneak back the other way. Uh, so there's always that reversible reaction, even though if it may be really, really small, that's kind of going in the other direction. <clears throat> All right, let's see here. So if the equilibrium lies to the right, the value of K should be a large value or greater than one. Uh, lying to the right means more products. And obviously, if we have a smaller value of K to the left there, which means more reactants. All right. So uh, at the given temperature, K is 50. Calculate the equilibrium concentration of H2. So I think we did one similar to this, but uh, we would write our equilibrium constant expression here, which again would be our products. And we would have to square it because of the coefficient that is there divided by our H2 and our I2, and that would equal 50 here. At this point, uh, they gave us equilibrium concentrations of HI and I2, so we can solve for H2, and H2 would be the concentration of HI squared divided by 50, which is the K value, times the concentration of I2, and that's pretty much what they kind of did right there. And if we rearrange it and obviously solve for it by putting our numbers in, that is obviously what we should get there. We want to make sure that we do square that value. And we will get to our equilibrium one. So I think we did a similar one the other day where we were looking for the concentration of something that's unknown. Any questions on again it has to be equilibrium values to go into that equilibrium expression we're going to talk about here in a second what to do with non-equilibrium values and how to figure those guys out all right so let's talk a little bit about a specific equilibrium and that's what's referred to as a ksp and there's really all different types of equilibrium constant values. Uh, there's, you know, KC, KP, KW, KA, KB, KSP, KF. You know, these are all the ones that you'll learn if you go to 1B and stuff like that. But KSP is what's referred to as a solubility product. And it's really an equilibrium constant for things that we think about as being insoluble. So if you remember the solubility rules we talked about way back somewhere, um, those things that are insoluble, when we look them up, those ionic compounds, and our solubility rules tell us it should be a solid, even though something based on solubility rules, for example, is supposed to be a solid, it is still an equilibrium. So there's still a little bit of it that will break apart. It's going to be a very, very small amount. So for example, if we took silver chloride, which based on solubility rules tells us it is a solid, it will still set up an equilibrium in solution and it will still be able to just a little bit uh, break apart into its ions. And because of that, we can write an equilibrium constant for it where we do our exact same thing, which is our products over our reactants. In this case, if we were to write the KSP for this guy, be the concentration of silver times the concentration of chloride should I include this guy in it? I should not, as that is a solid. So for KSP, especially, which are these things for things that are insoluble, that's pretty much the deal. You'll only have products because the reactants are always going to be solids. And that is what the equilibrium constant expression would look like. Now, if we had something like this, we can 
figure out the equilibrium concentration or the solubility of something like silver chloride in a solution. And here's another one. Uh, this is Bi2S3. And when it breaks apart here, breaks apart into a couple Bi3 pluses and three of these guys. If we were to write our expression, just like a normal equilibrium constant expression, we would take the coefficients as those exponents. Once again, here, our reactant side is a solid, which means it will not be included, obviously, in the equilibrium expression. So when we have something uh, like this, where we are going to do sort of an equilibrium constant expression, uh, we could actually do a calculation to figure out what everybody's concentration would be at equilibrium. So for example, let's take a look at this guy. And we have a saturated solution of lead to chloride and it's prepared by dissolving some salt in distilled water. And the concentration of lead two is determined to be 1.6 times 10 to the minus two. What is the KSP uh, value? So in this particular case, I'm gonna show you a calculation which is referred to as an ice table type calculation, which frankly, you're like two semesters too soon for this, but we'll do it. Uh, I don't know why they teach it here, but maybe so you've seen it. So we're going to talk about ice table sort of calculations. And we could use what's referred to as an ice table to help us sort of solve this problem correctly. And an ice table stands for initial change and equilibrium. this way so initial change in equilibrium so the first thing that we want to do is uh, we want to actually write this reaction of how it's going to break apart so here we have pb cl2 and it's going to break apart into a lead with a two plus ion and two of the Cl minuses. So remember that this two comes out in front when it breaks apart. All right, so in this situation, we could also write our KSP expression. And our KSP expression is the concentration of lead two times the concentration of chloride. And once again, I do need to square it because of that two that is there. So we're going to just kind of pretend like we really don't have any numbers other than, you know, we have the KSP value maybe given to us, but we don't. So initially here, because this is a solid, I'm not going to worry about it. And I'm going to initially say that I have zero amounts of each of these things. Now, the change part in an ice table is basically represented by a letter and most of the time people use X. Although sometimes in these type of calculations, people use S, but we'll use X to keep it kind of simple. So we do use X to represent the change part. And in most cases, that's sort of what we're trying to find when we do an ice table is like, what is the value of X is basically what we're trying to find. Now, when we think about this reaction, since we really have no products to begin with, which is usually a pretty safe assumption, this reaction should probably head in which direction to begin with? It should head towards the product side since we don't have any, right? So kind of all reactants. And we can make a pretty safe assumption in most cases that the reaction is gonna kind of head in that direction, which means typically speaking, the reactant should be decreasing in the amount that you started with, right? And then the product should be increasing. And in an ice table, we represent that with minuses and pluses. So because the reaction is heading to the product side, anybody on the reactive side is going to be minus Xs, as it should be decreasing. And on the product side, everybody should be increasing, so they're going to be plus Xs. 
In this particular case, though, we have a solid on the left-hand side, which means we don't include it in the equilibrium, so we're not going to do anything with it in terms of the ice table, and that's really a good idea because you might not want to use numbers you shouldn't. So typically speaking, this side would be minuses, but we're not going to do anything because it is a solid. This is going to then be plus x. And really important when you do an ice table, this is going to be plus 2x. And that is because of the coefficient. That really takes care of the stoichiometry, the multiple -mole relationship. So you do have to include those coefficients when you kind of do the change part. Otherwise, your answer will be incorrect. That means when we reach equilibrium here, again, we don't really have anything here because it's a solid. We're going to have x and 2x. Any questions on the ice table here? <clears throat> now, in a normal sort of ice table problem, you would have the k value given to you. And what you typically would do is you would take these values and basically put it into this expression. So you would go like the KSP is equal to x times 2x squared. And again, in a lot of problems, you will have this value given to you. And at this point, what you would do is go and solve for X, basically mathematically kind of solve for X, whatever that may look like. <clears throat> First off, any questions on that there? Why do we put the zero for, for which one? I'm sorry. For, for, for I, for yeah, so it, that's where you would put your initial concentrations. And in this type of equilibrium, uh, you really don't have any products usually. So if it doesn't mention anything about how much products you're starting with or anything like that, it's pretty safe to assume that they're going to be zero to start with. Yeah. It won't be 100% of the time, but probably most of the time that you'll come across, it's going to probably be zero. And also most of the time, that would also mean that the reaction would be heading towards the products. And that's why the minuses would be on the left-hand side and the pluses would be on the right-hand side. Other questions? Now, in this particular case, we actually don't need to solve it a traditional way because it already told us that the equilibrium concentration of lead to is 1.6 times 10 to the minus two. And if we go to our ice table, we can see that lead to at equilibrium is equal to X, which means that number really is 1.6 times 10 to the minus two. That X value right there is also this X value. They are the same. So we actually have everything that we need, which means we could go into our KSP and it would be 1.6 times 10 to the minus 2. I'll go underneath. We're going to times it by 2 times 1.6 times 10 to the minus 2, and we're going to still square it. Yeah. So if we do that there, we're going to take 2 times 1.6 to the minus two, we're going to square it and times it by 1.6 to the minus two. Going to give us a KSP value of 1.6 times 10 to the minus five. So this is sort of how you work an ice table. And usually, like I said, you will most likely have some reactant sort of side. And uh, you will have some initial values on that side and you could solve for it. Any questions on that there? All right, so why don't you try one here? Let's do one where we actually have stuff on every side. So we'll do uh, that one that we saw earlier, H2 plus I2 goes to 2HI. And we're going to go with the K is, we'll go with 50. Why not? All right, let's say, what is the equilibrium concentrations of all species if you started with 0 0.5 molar H2 and the same thing, 0 0.5 molar I2. I don't know if that came through or not, but I'll put it here, 0 0.5 molar 
Bless you. All right, K value is 50. The initial concentrations of each of these guys are 0.5. We were looking for what the equilibrium concentration would be for everybody. You do need to do a nice table. In this case, you will solve for X and to help you out. So take a few minutes, see what you get to, and then we'll talk about it together. And again, then let's take a look at it and see, hopefully you're starting in the right direction. So in this case, we have initial concentrations, not equilibrium concentrations. So that's always a key of, you got to do like a nice table to get to the equilibrium concentrations. So to do this, we're going to write our expression like we saw earlier, I think for this one, it's going to be our products, which is HI squared divided by our reactants, which is H2 and I2. And again, that's going to equal 50. So initially here, we were given the concentration of H2, which is 0.5, and also our I2, which is 0.5. They're both gases, so they're going to be included. And here, there is no mention of HI, so much like the sort of earlier question, it is pretty safe to assume that it's going to be zero here. So there's nothing mentioned about you know, how much of that you're starting with. Clearly, if it was mentioned, you got to put it in, but in this case, it was not. <clears throat> because all we are starting with is reactants, it is pretty safe to assume that this reaction should be heading in this direction towards the product side, which means our reactants should be decreasing with time and our product should be increasing with time. Again, we represent that as minus X, minus X and plus two X. Again, important to put the two there. We don't put anything here because the coefficient is one basically. Yeah, so that's one X. We get down to our equilibrium line. We're just going to carry everybody down. That's 0.5 minus X, 0.5 minus X, and 2X. Any questions on the table here? At this point, the goal is to really figure out what X is here. So we're going to take everybody that's on this equilibrium line, and we're going to put everybody into that expression and then we're going to use it to solve for x. So to do that, that's going to give us 2x squared divided by 0 0.5 minus x times 0 0.5 minus x is equal to 50. And again, all I did was take each of these and basically put it into this expression here in the right location. Yeah. All right. Looking at this, there's multiple ways you could solve these type of problem. If you use the quadratic formula, you could use successive approximation, none of which we should ever do in this class because we shouldn't even be doing this anyways, but uh, we'll do it. Uh, what we're going to do here when we look at it is it's actually a perfect square on both sides. Yeah, you could take a big giant square root on both sides. And when you do that, you're gonna be left with two X on top, 0 0.5 minus x. And the thing I personally forget to do is actually take the square root of 50 and not write 50 again. So take the actual square root. And if you take the actual square root of 50, it looks like you get 7.071. Now we're going to solve for x, which means we need to multiply whatever's on the bottom to the other side. And if we do that, that gives us 2x is equal to... 7.071 times 0 0.5, 3.536, we'll call it, 3.6 minus 7.071x. We need to combine x to the same side. So we're going to add this, right, to that side. That's going to give us 9.071x is equal to 3.536. Lastly, we're going to divide, yeah. That's going to give us an X value of 0 0.390, we'll call it. Any questions on that? Yeah. It might be, yeah. We'll see. We'll see how I feel. I don't know. But All right. Now, that X value that we got is actually not the answer, right? That X value that we got is actually all the x values here which means to find the equilibrium concentration everybody we got to put those numbers back into each of those so to finish it out here 
the concentration of H2 would actually equal the concentration of I2, which is 0 0.5 minus X. So it's gonna be 0 0.5 minus 0 0.390. That's going to give us 0.5 minus 0 0.390, 0 0.110 molar. And the concentration of HI at equilibrium is 2 times X, which means that would be 2 times 0 0.390. And 2 times 0 0.390 gets us 0 0.78 molar. So it's important to make sure that you do obviously go back and put your actual X values in there. Any questions on that? By the way, it is math, which means we could check it. Now that I do have the equilibrium concentrations, right? Which are these, if I take them and put it back in here, it should equal what number? Should equal about 50, yeah? A little bit off with rounding. So you could actually check yourself by putting those values back into it. And with rounding, you should be in the same ballpark of what the K value is. If you find yourself really, really far away, probably some math went wrong along the way there. Any questions on ice tables, which you will probably not see until can one be again, yes. Perhaps on the final, I'm not sure, but we'll see. Any question on that?